Hi everyone, welcome to Casual Watch Talk Live, the Sunday social. Hope you're all doing well. Well, uh, we'll we've got a couple of things on today, but also I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for questions as well. So if you've got any questions for any of the panel, uh, perhaps on things that we're talking about or any general questions, let us know in the comment section. But let's kick it off. Mark, you're in the hot seat. What are you, what are you wearing? Let me uh, zoom you in. I've got a watch to frighten every every watch journalist in the business. 43 millimeters and 200 plus grams of Christopher Ward uh, Trident Pro. This is the SH21 limited edition from 2014. The second watch to use the SH21 mechanism. And it's a big boy, but it's a great yeah. watch. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to try. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Mark. I'm just going to play with your audio a little bit. Uh, it, it just went a little bit quiet there, but yeah, that is a really cool. I was actually uh, I made a video with Mike France about the Bel Canto and uh, the fact that there was a delay, and somebody, a lot of people commenting saying about, well, they should have known, and I was like, they they literally do one run of their limited edition watches. That that they they uh, to them it would have been the blue and the green like they it, they would never have sold it. I said they have some they release some limited editions that are available for six weeks, six or seven weeks, um, don't they? Sometimes the, the one I just yeah they also you, uh... was available for two years. It took a yeah. long time to sell this one out. Yeah, also with things like Bill Canto, um without sounding hoity about it, most folk have no understanding of the supply chain of the Swiss watch industry, which is. Um, not quite as smooth, shall we say, sometimes as uh, other industries are. And uh, I mean, you only need to look at uh, the car industry, you know, after uh, COVID to see that it doesn't take very much to the supply chain to get interrupted. You know, when you've got a product that's consisting of hundreds, if not thousands of parts, one of them's missing. Bob's your uncle, product's delayed, sadly. Or, yeah. or if you get one problem somewhere, it can take weeks, yeah. months to recover from just one little glitch somewhere. Yeah. Especially when something's a little bit more kind of uh, exoteric and unusual and there may be only a very limited number of suppliers. So, um, yeah, but, you know, and that watch took off, as we all know. It's um, been dramatically successful for them. So when you get something like that that does this, it's not as easy as phoning someone up and going, please send me some more screws. To be fair, if they made them in the Middle East or Asia and everyone accepted that, then... I guarantee you, you could make supply chain much shorter, but you know everyone insists they want it to be made in Switzerland. So uh, you take the punches with the swings. Yeah, exactly. And if anybody wants to see my uh, little snippet video I did with Mike about the Bel Canto, if anybody's waiting on your Bel Canto orders and you you wanting a little update, obviously it's in the. On I the believe main Dave might be waiting on his Bel Canto. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can neither confirm nor deny many things on that front, but we'll see. We'll leave that. <laughs> we'll leave that for now. Um, yeah, Canadian Watch Monkey. Yeah, we seem to. We do seem to be having a little bit of audio on, on Mark. I wonder, Mark, if, if maybe it's worth you trying to rejoin or something. Or sorry, I know we're, we're doing it live. It's not never good to mess around with the audio, but you kind of come in like uh, quiet and loud. Is that better? I just upped the gain. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Dave, what's what's on your wrist? So this week, I've got something a little bit different. I came back from uh, Geneva Watch Days to something that I completely forgot. I had orders, not the quite right. Uh, quite, ordered is not quite the right word. I had uh, uh, backed this on Kickstarter and uh, it appeared. And it's this little unusual beast, which is wow. a watch called the Cylindrix, and it is effectively a cylinder of sapphire uh, glass, uh, this all being sapphire here, and it's got right, two watch right, movements. Apologies, to Alexa's right, decided to interrupt. <laughs> Thank you for that, Alexa. Um, <laughs> it's got two movements, they're both mechanical. It's a Miyota movement, so nothing super fancy, but there's a little uh, watch on the end here with Loom, etc. And this is a Miyota. And then we have a watch in here, which is told the time by, I don't know if we'll see it with a light, but there's these little orange bars with Loom pips on the end and these different time grades, and you tell the time by them. And then you have the automatic rotor 
in here, which spins around like a little turbine. It's very funky, and it cost me, I think, the grand sum of, I think it was about £400 that I bid in it, because I thought it's not a huge amount of money for something a bit funky. It'll either be a pile of junk, which it may turn out to be still, so let's not take too early, but it's so far so good. Seems to be telling the time. Both uh, clocks are actually keeping synchronicity with each other, even though they're completely separate movements, which is uh, not a bad thing. But for for 400 quid, it's uh, a cool wee toy. That's a very um, cool toy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm heartily is. jealous. Yeah, it is cool. That. So is the, does the one rotor wind the both watches? Or No, no so basically... This one here, so it's a Miyota 6L17 or something along those lines, and this was a very small mechanical automatically wound movement that Miyota made. They stopped making it by all accounts and then did a bit of a competition with some watch brands to say, we will remake it if someone does something that is meaningful stroke we can do something with. So these guys did this. So effectively, this year, is just a little small automatic movement. I think it's 13 millimetres roughly across, so pretty yeah. small. I mean, there's a, there's a fingernail to give you some comparison, so, you know, it's not it's not big. And in it, effectively, this, if you imagine this bit at the end here, is the watch. This is the crown here mm. for this watch. The rotor is hidden, so you've got the dial, the glass, or sorry, the, the crystal, the dial with the hands, the movement and the rotors behind it. This here, which is the other watch, this is the back of it, so to speak. So this is the case back, which is the rotor. The movement is in here. And then these little bars come out and they actually spin round. So these numbers don't move. The numbers oh, yeah. stay still. And these, you see these different bars here? Yeah. So with a little little loom pips on the end, they move round. So it's a really clever little design. All these numbers as well are loomed. So at night, the whole uh, number set looms as do the little arms and the little pips as do the hands and the second hand on this side um yeah it's just a bit funky and this is i thought this would be plastic but this is actually sapphire glass and i've tested it and it is sapphire glass it's got um dual sided anti-reflective coatings on it it's a decent quality stainless steel and the quality of the finishing and the machining is put it this way you could easily charge quite a lot more for it and folk would still be quite happy so yeah it's a funky little toy Wow, and you could keep two different time zones. Not hundred percent; they're completely independent. So you've got two crowns. You can see them, two crowns, just where my fingers are here and here. So you can set both of them to entirely different times if you wish to. Awesome, cool. That's really cool, Steve. What are you wear? What are you wearing? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I just got this a uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, see if I can get it to show up here. It's a Nomos Club Campus. It's, this kind of blue purple color and it's 36 millimeters. Um, I think Nomos watches are really cool, although I've never owned one before. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, I uh, put down an order, I think about six months ago. That's how long it took to, to actually get it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's really super neat and uh, really love wearing it. Um, speaking of funky, it's got kind of funky colors as well. And, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm into anything that's a little bit off the beaten path. So, uh, totally scratches the edge for me. Yeah, that's really cool. cool. Watch that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Lovely piece, that Club, one. Club Campus for me is if someone says they've got about thousand pounds, thousand bucks, thousand euros, whatever, and they want a nice mechanical entry level watch, arguably that's the one that will. I, I pretty much without fail recommend that every time because you've got what three or four size, I think three sizes now currently. Like mm-hmm. there's the three sizes on it. You've got a multitude of you can get anything from in your face bright to pretty undertoned as well and it's a bit of a strap monster as well cool yeah it's really cool and then i'm wearing um i'm wearing I, I seem to have broke the internet or at least my channel but i made a video saying that i didn't like a grand seiko and it's it's performed better than any video that i've ever done uh, so if, i'm sure everyone's seen it but if you haven't seen it check it out uh, this is i actually got i'll do a review of it but this is the replacement one that i got so this is the quartz version the replacement one I talked about in the video, and I've been wearing it, um, wears a lot better than the spring drive one. Uh, the the clasp is just, it, it needs micro adjustment, I'm not going to lie. But it is nice. It, it wears well. So I'm going to do a full review of it. I'm also going to do a full review of this. I've got this uh, Mugen uh, edifice. So we'll do that. Okay. 
before we uh, before we dive into, we're going to talk a little bit uh, because the thumbnail said so. We're going to do a little bit of uh, GPHG or talk about the, some of the GPHG watches because there's a couple of couple of fan favorites in there. But before we do that, Dave, do you want to give us? A, you were lucky enough to go to Geneva Watch Days. Do you want to give us a? Do you mind giving us a summary? I'll, I'll put you on the top. Uh, how, or how sure. do you find it? So. Um... Java Watch Days, if anyone doesn't know, is it's been going for a few years now, and effectively it is a what they call a decentralised show. So unlike traditional shows like say Watches and Wonders or you know, actually actually any other show, which tends to be in a hosted venue, whether a exhibition hall or a you know Fate Hall, Church Hall, right up to Grand Pal Expo in Geneva. This is an idea where lots of brands have got together and said, okay, let's do something at the same time in the same town and broadly, give or take, in the same general small area where we can throw the narrative of what we are doing, how we want to engage with people in our way without having to be stuck to this very segmented and regimented kind of, uh, you've got your booth, do what you're told. So what happens is in the centre of Geneva, which if anyone's ever been to Geneva, you'll know this, but if you haven't, it's a beautiful you know, town. It's Swiss, so it's hardly poor anyway. But it's a you know, it's a beautiful city, right on the loch or the lake side. Loch, my Scottishism is coming out there. So the the lake side of Lake Geneva, and you've got some beautiful big traditional hotels there, like the Beau Rivage and a few of these kind of very high end hotels. What happens is each brand either takes a, a suite in a hotel or a room or some of them actually take a boat out on Lake Geneva or some of them have a boutique nearby or, you know, there's a variety of different spaces that they'll use and they exhibit to all and sundry. And unlike a lot of shows which are based around press only or retailers only, this is open to press, retail, br- other brands and Joe, blog, Joe, Joe blogs as well. All you need to do is register. It doesn't cost anything. You don't need to buy a ticket. You don't need to pay for anything. You just need to get yourself there and book some appointments with people to go and see them. And if you've not got an appointment, you can kind of wing it and go in and say, if you're quiet, any chance I can have a look? And eight, nine times out of ten, they say, yep, come on, come on and have a look around. Might not only be able to give you five minutes, but you've got everyone from MBNF, Mozar, uh, you've got Grubel for say, so you've got you know absolutely top of the tree, down to brands you'll never have heard of, and everything in between. And over the years, more and more of the I guess mainstream brands have been attending. So, you know, George Kern was there from um, uh, from Breitling. You've got uh, uh, who else? Uh, Bulgari were there. Tag Heuer were there. You know, there's lots of brands that you might not expect a show like that, who do make an appearance as well. And as time has gone on, it's become more important. So typically most of the brands at least have something, one or maybe sometimes two pieces that they actually launch at the show. So it's not just a recap of what's been going on. There's more and more to see at this show now as well. So a bit like Dubai Watch Week, there's always usually something launched there. It's just a great show and it's very chilled, very laid back, no dress codes, no nothing. If you're registered and you want to go to one of the parties at night, as long as you're registered, you're on the guest list. You can go in, you can quaff drink with all the brands, you can watch Oreo Backs do a uh, kind of a auction that he's done. You can, at nearly without fault, every one of them, their CEO was there. So, you know, you want to talk to Max Busser, he's sitting in the stand, you can walk in and say, oh, hello, Max. Uh, Edward Malin is there from Moza. You can get and talk to them as well. So it's really very um, engaging. So anyone that's got the opportunity to get to Geneva for that week, very highly recommended. Lots of really cool stuff was launched uh, this year from right across the board. You even had, you know, MBNF and Moza were doing an entry for Only Watch, the big auction, big charity auction that's coming up. They decided to not announce with everyone else what was coming but they announced it and launched it at the show. And it was great um, because, you know, they had a little room and you had Joe Bloggs right through to CEOs of other companies standing watching this presentation as they announced it to the world. And then you could get hands on on it. So it is a, it is a great show, really chilled out, laid out. So, yeah, that's it. There's so many uh, releases. I don't even know where I could start because you could fill hours talking about things that have released, but there was some really cool stuff for me. What was my highlight? The MBNF Moser was 
very good, but it's a piece unique and it will sell for a eye watering sum of money. Things you can buy. Uh, who do I like? Uli Nardan released a new version of the Blast with a silicon marquetry on it, and it was just unbelievably cool. Uh, just taking the use of silicon away from a technical use, which they are arguably the masters of, and using it purely for decoration as well. So yeah, that was that was super cool. Um, yeah, just some some amazing stuff to be seen. And uh, speaking of only watch, do you want to uh, talk about the results of every watch? Because you guys did an amazing job with with every watch and raising money for Maggie's. Thank you. And to be honest, that that doesn't lie to us. That dies. That 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 lies with the people that basically actually paid their their good money and and uh, and, and bought watches. But yeah, um, in the grand scheme of auctions, it was a tiddly wink. But you know, we did it because uh, that, uh, Maggie's cancer charity. Which is UK wide and a, li- a little bit wider now is pretty close to a lot of people's hearts and yeah it went way beyond expectations and we got people from you know Europe and the US uh, bidding and winning on some of the pieces as well so yeah thanks for bringing that up Mark but the thanks for that mainly well, predominantly goes out to the auction house who did it and the brands who provided the pieces and most importantly the people who actually physically put their money where their mouth is and and I think you raised seventy five thousand dollars. Uh, like it that? was it was just shy of sixty thousand UK pounds, so whatever oh. the conversion rate is just now, probably something like seventy five to eighty thousand US dollars. Yep, yeah, so something in that neck of the woods. So yeah, really good. So you know that's we 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 were we were pretty gobsmacked. We were kind of crossing our fingers and hoping maybe twenty five, maybe thirty on a good day. You know, but I mean things like the uh, Studio Underdog there. I think what that albeit you can't buy that piece unique, but the equivalent viable products, what, £550, £600, mm. $650. And I think it sold for £16,000. So, it, it, yeah, it did pretty well. Somebody uh, somebody who bought it, who wants to remain nameless, actually, is very, very happy with their purchase. So fair play to them. Oh, that's really, really cool. Oh, congratulations on that. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so we've got... a. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Colin's Colin's saying great job. On the, uh, and then Bobby's Bobby's uh, Bobby's saying uh, Dubai Watch Week is the best watch event in the globe today, as casual as possible, plus as safe as can be. I would agree. Um, of all the shows that happen, if you want to look at it, I guess holistically from a point of view of the whole shoot match, it is the best overall watch show. Dubai is safe, albeit. You know, Dubai is Dubai, and there's pros and cons with lots of countries in the world. But you know, as a as a venue, for sure, it's super safe. Um, it's great because lots of brands go. Pretty much all of them. There's the odd one that doesn't go. They keep it very equitous from that point of view, and it's got a lot of access to it as well. But I guess it depends where you are in the world, because Dubai is not the cheapest place in the world to get to, and or the cheapest place to stay. You can do it for a lot less than you potentially think you can. But it's not the cheapest place in the world to go. To be fair, neither is Geneva. Yeah, so it's... that's what June is asking. Sorry, sorry, yeah, uh, Steve. He was asking, um, is the barrier to entry for Geneva days? Is it the hotel rooms? Are they no? No, no. Actually, um, them. I was actually quite amazed. So Geneva is not a particularly cheap city, but it's in parity with, say, London or New York or any other metropolis. It's not insanity money. It can be if you want it to be, but it's not insanity money. I typically stay at, there is a uh, Ibis chain hotel, a core group have got an Ibis Styles, which is a perfectly nice hotel that's up by Pal Expo. And I managed to book it for €100 Euros a night. So that, in my opinion, is not particularly expensive. So I think I paid 300 and whatever, 350 uh, Swiss francs all in for three nights. The beauty of uh, Geneva is they understand about tourism. So the minute you book a hotel, you get a free travel pass for all forms of transport for the whole city for the duration of your stay. And there's a bus that runs from the hotel into the centre, which takes the grand sum of 11 minutes, and you get it for free. And there's one every six minutes, so it's not difficult. And you go in and you can eat for as cheap as you want if you want to just go to the supermarket, or you can spend eye-watering sums of money having a steak and chips, which is the worst steak and chips you want in the world, (laughs) but it'll still charge you a thousand euros for it. So, um, yeah, if you want to do it, and 
you don't need to book super early. I only booked my hotel 10 days out. Yeah. That's amazing. And if you're flying from Europe, the joy of EasyJet, the world's um, almost worst airline, only superseded by Ryanair, is... Uh, but they tend to run broadly on time. I wouldn't say it's particularly pleasant, but when you've only got an hour, two hours to fly, it's not the end of the world if you're young and vibrant, which I am neither. <laughs> That's the trouble with, with Dubai. It's a long way from the US. Yeah, it's a, yeah. I think a 13, direct, it's a 13-hour flight there and a 16-hour flight back. Yeah. But, you know, um, if you want to go for a one-off experience, just to see a different culture, an entirely different place, and throw in uh, Dubai Watch Week. It's 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 worth it, but uh, it, it's much more. You have to think about it for the US than you would e- even from Europe because you're you're cutting the distance yeah. in half. And, sa- and sadly, the US don't do cheap flights like Europe does. Europe genuinely does cheap air travel. You know, like I think I paid oh, yeah, the grand right, yeah. sum of. I think I paid the grand sum of £65 return from the UK to Geneva, which is uh, is quite literally cheaper than getting the train from Glasgow to London. So um, we are very uh, lucky that way. Maybe not great for the environment, to be honest, but um, uh, uh, cheap to get around if you want to. And, but, that's uh, a, as I say, once... but, but that's a flight even a Yorkshireman can afford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, abso- absolutely. So if, you, if you're in Europe or you're in the UK, certainly um, it's, broadly speaking, a no-brainer. Cool. Steve, I cut you, you off can the definitely drink. You can, you, can drink, you can drink your weight in free alcohol on each of the evening parties that will more than make up for your hotel room and expenditures on flight. Let me put it like that. And my head is attesting to that right now. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's that's re- that's really cool. So, um, so it's less. It's, it's, it was the original idea of Dubai Watch Week that the smaller brands who perhaps can't haven't got the investment to go to watches and wonders. It was sort of like an open house type of thing, it, and then it's grown from there. Um, Dubai Watch Week was kind of how to best described. So it, right. it's, a, it's, run by, it's, it's run by the family who are arguably the largest retail group within. Dubai and Saudi, and that's their kind of gig. They run, it's not, it's not Saudi, sorry, uh, United Arab Emirates. They run um, a huge uh, retail business that not all the brands, but many of the brands are represented, whether they are mainstream brands or independent brands. And I guess originally the idea was it was a show to allow all those brands to come to their area to effectively bolster their retail business, but it kind of grew into something more. They weren't as clinical, maybe, as the Americans or Europeans might have been about, this is about selling, so we're going to sell. They kind of said, if you bring the things to the people, the people will like them and therefore they'll buy them. So it's very, very hands-off from a kind of selling perspective. But all these brands come. Usually their big bosses come because, again, they know that this is a wealthy market who are very people-centric. You know, that market very much is about relationships and you're buying from people and if they like the product but they don't like the person they'll still probably not buy it you know they're quite um specific that way so they make everyone broadly speaking other than a couple of brands who just that's how they are everyone's got an equitous booth it's a very basic white booth you stick a couple of stands and you stick your watches in it so it keeps it very much a you know it's not like formula one where if you've got bigger budgets and bigger backers you've got faster cars broadly speaking it's a bit more equitous than that but they've kind of bolted on uh, chats and panels and discussions and collectors corners and all sorts of stuff like that as well and it's turned very much into not even a show a bit of a bit of a festival it's got a bit of a festival feel to it as well and it's free so whether you're press or you're public or retailers as long as you can get your physical body there and register it's free to it's free to attend and, and i think um ahmed siddiqui and son are the biggest single retailer of rolex in the world they sell more rolexes than anybody else oh, wow. wouldn't be surprising wouldn't be surprising and i think you'll probably find that there's a couple of brands that fall under that category with these guys as well you know you're you're arguably talking to one of the richest uh, markets for watches globally and you know with very low uh, levels of uh, 
VAT and tax, etc. there as well, it does make it quite an attractive uh, buying proposition for many people. Cool. Awesome. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that come in. So Thomas is saying, uh, I really like the Moser X MBNF. Uh, is it, I, I, thought, I was trying to find it. Is it, is it this one? No. Nope. Um, it is called the Pandemonium. So it's, okay. uh, that's it. No, 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 no. Uh, this... It's probably at the top of their webpage. If you go to Moser, it's probably maybe if you type in Moser only. Ah, there you go. That's it. That's the that's it right oh, there. Oh, this is it. Oh, it's, it's a streamline. Little... Streamline. Oh, yeah, wow. I'm sorry, I've gone off the screen, but it's uh, it's this little puppy here. This little guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, it's um, the guys have done collabs before. As you know, MBNF and Moser have collabed before. And they decided to do it again. But they've done so well with it previously. I think, well, certainly from uh, having a chat with Edward, his, their, their fear was very much that if we do something, it has to be even better again because, you know, you can't go backwards. Um, so Streamliner, which not everybody loves it, but... I think way more people like it than dislike it as a general rule. So they've used the kind of architecture of the Streamliner, which is pretty unique, and it's very much the DNA of Moser. You know, you see one, you know it's a Moser. And, you know, with the kind of architecture from the movement, very much having that nod to MBNF, it is a chiming watch. So what you have is you can see in the image there the little panda. I don't know if you move your cursor over it, you can... Maybe just see him. There he is there. Hmm. Yeah, that's him hiding there. And what he is, is he's a DJ. So you can see the little uh, black uh, records just in front of him. Oh, yeah, with the pause. They're, they're, they're the pivot points of the gongs for the um, for the chime. And effectively, he DJs like this on the records as the gongs go. So he looks like he's playing two records as the chimes go, which is super cool. The little, um, he's like a very miniature version of this. He's made out of solid white gold and enameled. Um, just super cool. And it's not static. It is, he does do this as the gongs go, which is, it is really, really quite cool. Um, it's a, it's a stunning piece of, uh, you know, a stunning piece of work. Um, very much true to the only watch and the piece unique kind of uh, ideology. I think they've marked a three hundred to four hundred thousand uh, price on it, on the basis that a chiming watch from these guys is in and about that three to four hundred thousand pound or a euro mark, and hopefully it'll get a lot more. I would suspect it will get. If it doesn't make seven figures, I reckon it will get pretty close. Yeah, yeah that's. Uh... That's a million dollar watch. Yeah, you know. I mean, the, there, there's no watch worth a million, but when it comes to a charity watch, that's pushing that's, the boundary. That, that's, that's a good candidate. That's, that's, that's king, king of the crop, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm not the greatest MBNF fan, and you can tell that somebody with good taste, as i.e. Moser, dictated a lot of that. MBNF made it work, but Moser had the taste to make it look that good. That's Depends, I think, what happens with them is when they do collabs, they decide time about who takes, I guess, creative control of it, ultimately. And uh, it was very much, that's very much more Moser than MB yeah. in my opinion. And, and it's just, it works as a whole. It's not just a dial or yeah. a mechanism. It actually flows into the case. That's a stunner. If that doesn't make a million dollars, I don't know what will. Exactly. Yeah. And it is, it is, when you see it in real life as well, it's just... It's, it's 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 so cool. Yeah. Um, and then just seeing if we've got any other questions. Oh, somebody somebody's asked me a question. Uh, you enjoy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Really enjoyed your video recent GS acquisition. Really interesting story. Is it put off buying watches you haven't properly tried on? <laughs> so difficult though, isn't it? I mean, it's really. It, it was very rare that I get a watch that fits so poorly on my wrist as that one. It, there, at one other time, it's happened. And that was a Squale watch. So it's a lot of people are giving me a hard time in the comments about not trying it on first. And I'm like, what can you do? If you, has any, 
we buy watches online all the time. So you can't you know, buy anything. The bit I love about that, Sam, is you weren't exactly complaining about the fact that you, you, you went, it's my fault, I bought it without trying it. Yeah. You know, if you were going, this is outrageous, it doesn't fit because I didn't try it. You, you've owned the fact that you made that mistake, whatever it is. That's life these days. It's just the fact that it didn't fit and you hoped it would. But welcome to the internet, everybody. Welcome to the internet. <laughs> Welcome to YouTube like comments, that. certainly. Yeah, avoid yeah. YouTube comments. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. It's wild. Some of the co- but it's amazing. But uh, I, I suppose the joke there is: has it put me off buying stuff on, on on buying watches online? No, but it's put me off making any content that isn't um, that isn't um, having a rant about a watch because it seems to be really. Bad. <laughs> I'm going to give up the. I might as well just give up the reviews now and just be. The, the the ranty guy the uh, although I wasn't ranting too much maybe I'll be like the gentleman ranter or something <laughs> maybe I'll switch the channel name up uh, but uh, thank you very much for the question thank you okay well let's uh, let's dive into um, uh, let's dive into the GPHG uh, I didn't put it in the title because whenever I put GPHG in the title even on the podcast it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to attract a lot of attention so I don't know if people people care um i mean they should care but i don't know if they necessarily do um that was more of a statement than a question <laughs> but um i, I the, the, the two, there's two that stood out for me well there's three that stood out for me but before i dive into this does anybody have an opinion on gphg uh, after my sweeping statement i should probably um be careful what i say here oh you've got to be oh. very careful dude <laughs> <laughs> I will not say we will not say anything. Uh, we will talk about um, um, yes, people care. Yeah. Um, no, do you know? Um, I'm quite um, open about the fact that it's far from perfect, and it is far from perfect. You know, um, but I think for me, it falls into the same category as generally any industry that has a awards-based system that is dictated effectively by the industry itself it's always going to have quite a lot of um, opinion politics and all the things that probably shouldn't be mixed into the judging um, area it is how it is you know and I think that can be said quite fairly for any industry to be honest with you but for me what it does do is it does allow anybody to enter so it's not initially a leaked list. Anybody that wants to punt something forward of their own volition can do it. And this year, there's certainly a couple that would never, ever, ever, ever have got selected by anybody in the industry who put their watches in and have got further than they probably thought they would. And I think we probably all know, I'm sure we'll talk about it at some point, the brand that's done that. And... There's always a chance that somebody will enter and get either through to the leaked list or win it that wouldn't have if they weren't able to enter their own watch effectively into this competition. I don't think that's a bad thing, to be honest with you. You know, it's another avenue that allows people to get some exposure. Is Are certain brands likely to win the category because they've won the category every year ever since the time of dawn? Uh, yes. But, you know, welcome to politics. That's just how it is. But I think it's it's not it's worse to not have it than to have it. Yeah. And I think with GPHG does some things very well. They are extremely open about their rules. You can go on GPHG.org. You can look at the rules. You can read them section by section. You can read how they how the voting is carried out uh, and so on. Um, they use notaries for for things. Um, if you dig into the details, some of the judging criteria are a little bit loose. So you can say it's the best in a certain category, which is, of course, open to interpretation. Um, I think the academies um, are subject to a lot of groupthink and politics. Um, you can see that there are and I did this for my own interest. Um, I went back through GPHD back to 2010, and you can see that some brands 
seem to win on a regular basis and it might be questionable whether they were actually the best in the category. Um, no one's ever going to make me an academy judge of um, GPHG, um, so I can say that. Um, but in terms of how the organization organizes it, um, I think they actually do a decent job and they're as open and honest about things as they can be. Um, you know, you can, they keep a decent archive. You can go back and look at every watch that was entered from the start. I think they do a good job of um, changing the categories to suit changing times and changing tastes. Um, their biggest weakness is the fact that it's the judges are from the industry. Yeah. Awesome. Um, before, well, we'll hit on the, the three probably to talk about. Um, Thomas is saying, I really hope that Tudor don't win again. Uh, so I think he's talking about, I presume that's the Black Bay 58, uh, 54, is it, that's been nominated? Tudor, um, have, Tudor have two watches, one in the sports category and one in the Petit Agui category. So they have okay. two watches through to this round. Okay, let's have a look then. So we've got the men's. Um, it, it's sometimes easier just to go to gphg.org and look yeah. there, Sam, but whichever works for you. Um, there we go. Okay, let's have a look. So let's just see where we are now. You can do it from the menu at the top. Oh, from here. Nom uh, there, nominated. There you go. Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I should have. I should have got this up. Okay, so you, the first one. Uh, t tell me if anybody wants me to stop on anything. Um, but I was going to look for. Okay, so the um, the ingenieur got. Uh, uh, also, the uh, the glass box tag got under iconic, which is interesting, um, and then. Which one did, did you mention, Mark? Sorry. I say, didn't the Monaco win Iconic last year? I, yeah, um, but, you know, if, if, let's uh, let's look at the brave Brits. I think you've got um, Studio Underdog. Have a watch yes. in this section. Yeah, Studio Underdog's under the, is it the last section that is something like, there we go, it's yeah. called Challenge. Challenge, yeah. Challenge yeah, so this France. is the one under two. Is that your... Is that your one, Steve? Your Namos? Um, yeah, I think I think this is uh, the 38 millimeter version. But yeah, it's the exact same watch, just in a slightly different size and color. And uh, you know, I'm I'm biased. I I think, um, and 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 I, I guess I'm, I, I've had the Kool Aid, right? I've been drinking the the Nomos Kool Aid. Um, I mean, I think they're super cool watches. You know, is it something really new? Is it something really quote unquote challenging? I would probably disagree on that, but I mean, I, I, I do think that they're really nice watches. But by challenge, typically the definition of that category is brands that are maybe not at the same level or they are, they're either newcomers or they're brands that are kind of challenging the more established uh, narrative within the watch industry is kind of what they mean by challenge. Hmm. Hmm. Like, yeah, like, uh, like Seiko, the upcomer, upcomer Seiko. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember. Why, I know, why are they in this category? Why is Seiko here? I, I know they have a, def, a definition in the rules. I think Challenge is now under 2,000 Swiss francs. Oh. Yeah, that, that's what it, it has, says. It has, that's, part, that's part of it as well, yeah. That's part of it. Um, it so, I mean, I've got a question. Obviously, uh, you know, everyone seems to like Studio Underdog. But do they, I mean, and they look really cool, but I think the the you, the unique selling point on that is the dial, isn't it? Because other than that, it's fairly off the shelf. Is I, I think of it being fairly off the shelf. It's got a seagull movement. It's got a case that is, I'm guessing, not proprietary or not specially machined for these watches. I'm throwing it out there. So... It was surprising to me that they were in that category um, in a GPHG award. When you when when you enter as well, though, you submit your watch to the category that you wish to submit it to, subject to the outline of the rules. So, 
you don't get assigned to a category. You assign your watch as you enter to a category subject to it meeting the criteria of that category. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the interesting thing is people, I think, sometimes mistake it, that the quote-unquote best watch will win a category. And it's not necessarily about the best watch. Obviously, the best watch can also be, I guess, um, judged by a multitude of things. Aesthetic, horological excellence, uh, materials, you know, how many different ways could we potentially uh, do that? And then, of course, many of them are subjective. There's a few that are definitely, you know, uh, measurable. For example, timekeeping for talking's sake. But you know, there's other prizes. The uh, you know, the kind of um, the, there's there's better competitions to enter if you want to go on down that line. But it does allow you know you only need to look at this category uh, to see you know Seiko, long established uh, watch company, Nomos, not really that old to be honest with you, but you know a fairly large uh, company these days. Um, who else have you got in there? Raymond Beale, you know, hardly a small player that's been about for a while, alongside something like Studio Underdog or Corona Tokyo in there as well. You know, so you've got, and, and again, price point in there, you know, even it's capped at a couple of thousand. You've got what Studio Underdog at 500 ish, mm. through to a couple of other watches in there that are probably literally touching the top end of the price point with the skin of their teeth. I think the beauty of it is it does allow a bit of a window to the world for certain products that probably just wouldn't get viewed in the same way if it wasn't for this competition. I, I really <laughs> like the, I, I, I know I'm, I'm going to go with the masses here, but I, I really do like the studio underdog watches. I think, you know, the, the biggest knock on them is that they uh, have a, you know, Chinese made seagull movement, but outside of that, I don't really see what the issue is. I mean, it's, um, you know, if you want a mechanical chronograph under a certain price point, I mean, it seems to be the, the best mechanical manually wound chronograph out there. And a lot of other companies are using them, you know, um, so I, I don't really have the issue with that. Um, I think what makes them kind of exciting is the fact that they don't take themselves too seriously. The, the, the watches are well executed, but they don't take themselves too seriously. And I think that's, it brings a little bit of a, a, a breath of fresh air because I think a lot of these brands, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, having the most sporty piece or having the most rugged piece. And this is like, you know, it's like a joke, right? It's like a joke that, that we're all kind of, you know, in on the joke with. Right. And, and I think it's very well executed as well, you know, like using the, um, the, the watermelon seeds for the hour markers. I mean, it's just, it's just a really fun piece and, and they've kind of extended that through their whole line. So, um, I, I think it's really cool. I, you know, I told you before we started the, the show today that I, I pre-ordered two of them uh, just because I've never seen them before and I'm, I'm interested to see what they look like in person. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have no issue with it. Uh, you know, if the, the main um, uh, problem that most people have is the movement because uh, I think outside of that, it's a, it's a fantastic watch. Well, that, that movement's got a history. It's a museum piece. Because it, it was was it was bought from the Swiss, I think, in the sixties or the seventies. Yeah. Lock, stock, and all the yes. machine parts, barrels, and it dates from the nineteen forties. So um, it, it it makes an Omega three two one movement look modern, and not a lot of not a lot of movements can say that. It also is a very attractive movement. You look at the case back of that movement; it's a very attractive movement. It may not yep. be the most reliable. It may not be the best timekeeper. It's inexpensive. It can be regulated, and it looks gorgeous. Yeah, and it's and it's very inexpensive. And you so, know, if you yep. want a uh, hand wound, nicely, you know, nicely finished, and it is nicely finished, albeit machine finished. If you want a nicely finished column wheel chronograph movement that looks as good as this for five six hundred bucks, good luck. You've got nowhere else to go. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe you could buy some of the main plates for another Swiss uh, movement uh, for that much money, but that's about all you'll get. 
Yeah, I mean, I I'll just shout out Dave at Detroit Mint who does sell this <laughs> watch with this movement in that's about three hundred dollars as well. So just before he, before uh, Dave, if you're watching, I just thought I'd give you a shout yeah. out. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, d I don't know when I when I saw it, I was thinking, is it does it break? Is the GPHG about watches that are kind of this category, like a challenge, like it's breaking new ground? Because this is like a pop music to me. It's it's really cool at the moment, and we really like it, and we're liking the new sound. But it's also a remix of a lot of other things. Um, I, I I think if if you read the rules, the rules are very simple. It says yeah. the best watch under two thousand okay. Swiss francs. Uh, so it could be anything. What you're looking at is the nominate is the watches that got through the first round. So these are the nominated yep. watches. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, and I don't know if they have the full list um, for for this year, but the full list for this category is huge. Right. It's about twenty three watches, I think it was for this category. <clears throat> so, um, you know, these are the ones that have made it through the the broader vote. Um. So you know, uh, the, the the you know somebody the, the judges for the full judging panel for round one has taken twenty something watches and brought them down to six for each category. So that's yeah. a that's a terribly tough job, and yeah. by the look of it, for this category, they've done a good job. Yeah, cool. Yeah, well, well good good luck to them. Um, next one up is the well, we got to talk about the Belcanto, haven't we? in here because that's really good um so what's you, what's this category is this this is the uh, petit agui which is um you can translate agui in different ways it can mean needle it can mean summit or it can mean hand as in watch hand um so i call this the small summit because you have the grand agui the big summit which is the you know the top prize this is um two thousand swiss francs to eight thousand swiss francs so, you know, best watch in that price. Um, I don't know whether Christopher Ward nominated the Bel Canto or it was nominated. There are two routes, uh, two routes for this year at least. Um, but I'm glad to see it there. This is, I think, the third watch Christopher Ward have had in GPHG. They had the C7 Apex in 2018 and a Trident Elite in 2019. But um, this year they've got the Bel Canto um and it's a good it's a good strong candidate even in even in a group that's as tough as this because i bet you that louis era as awful as i think it is that's going to get some votes come real judging time in november so that's a that's a good tough category this year tough call that one yeah yeah because i i can imagine if you can't afford a chicken you you're going to buy that louis era <laughs> <laughs> very reminiscent of that yeah because w w when i first saw this that's what i thought it was and i go no it can't be um it's not to my taste in the slightest but that's a strong category watch i think that louis era yeah I, it would be nice for christopher ward to win the for the bel canto with the, the amount of effort that's gone into it for them i mean not saying that the others haven't put effort into it but it seems more they really went out on a limb and look at this paying off for them. Okay, so next one up I noticed was um I mean do we want to talk about the the onge is the ingenieur in two categories? It is, is it? Is it it's in the um sports and also the iconic. Wow. Yeah. What's and then you've got that Doxer army there as well, which is interesting. And a Grunfeld. And the other oh, Tudor. Yeah. So um, there's at least one watch that's got a strong history of winning that category in that category yeah. this year. Yeah. Yeah. So but this I'm, is a tough, this, this is a, for, for, for a Tudor, this is a tough year um, because there's a few pretty solid uh, alternatives from a variety of different um, kind of uh, reasons. One being, there's just some solidly good watches and they're up against it where in the past it's not always necessarily been the case and there's also some pretty um, meaningful brands up against them as well so it'll be interesting to see how this one goes 
but you know, Tudor have won, they've entered every year since 2013 and won eight of those 10 years. So they've got a good track record. Yeah. Is Doxa one that's, is that, is that surprising that there's a Doxa there? Or, or is it... um, I don't think it's necessarily surprising. Um, I think it would be surprising if it won, to be honest. <laughs> um, I don't think it's uh, particularly surprising. You know, Doxa is a brand that have, gone through a bit of a renaissance over the last few years and mm. are definitely more visible and more seen than they have been, you know, 10 years ago. They weren't seen at all very much, but they're becoming significantly more mainstream in terms of availability and ranging than they were before. So I think it's fair. A little bit in the same way as, you know, the show part, the Alpine Eagle. It's been about for a few years now, but in the last couple of years, it's begun to make a little bit of inroads into more of the mainstay in the main market. Yeah, I wonder if uh, I wonder if uh, the Alpine Eagle is getting a lot more attention because of uh, if anybody's watched the time teller, he's on a, a mission about what the dial texture looks like. Uh, I won't I won't mention it on here, but check out his channel. He's got he, he's quite opposed to the way that the dial texture looks. So. Um, <laughs> I, I, anyway, really like the uh, the Monza. I'm surprised nobody even even mentioned that. Out of, <laughs> all six. Oh yeah, you go for I mean, it. I think go. that's the best yeah. one. I, I really, okay. I really was impressed when I saw this. Uh, you know, at, at thirteen thousand five hundred francs. You know, I would never spend the money on it, but I think it's just an amazing looking piece and yeah, um, just super cool. I, I think that Monza might turn out to be a damn good bargain on the pre-owned market. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> could be a dark, could be a dark horse for a win as well. Yeah, yeah I like that, I like the hands on it. Um, okay, and then we've got the in the chronograph. We've got the the skipper, and then the the Grand Seiko te Tentograph, yep. which I think is, I mean, it's very technically capable, isn't it? I mean, they completely re they completely did the movement just for that watch. I think. Yep. Correct. Mm. Um, Again, a tough call. Some pretty strong ones, you know. Zinger um, in there as well. Have got a pretty tough uh, proposition. I, I think Grand Seiko might pinch this one. Yeah, it's. I saw uh, Teddy do a uh, a video on this one. It was spectacular the way they were because he actually had the guy from Grand Seiko on talking yeah. about it. Yeah, I like this one. Um, awesome. And then, is there anything? Anything else? Anybody in any of the categories that we we wanted to look over quickly? Um, I, I haven't scrolled through a lot of the list, but it's always worth looking at some of the jewellery pieces, just because they they cease to be watches. That they're, they're works of art first. And oh, these the, high the high jewellery pieces. Yeah, the high jewellery jewellery, and, and I'm you know, not into high jewellery at all. If you go to the top, there's a link to the each category oh yeah jewelry there oh, okay yeah again you're absolutely right uh, mark um for me like whenever I, you know i'm at uh, say watches and wonders or whatever actually some of the most interesting pieces the things that you'll never see again and yeah. you'll know no one you, you don't know anyone will probably buy it is generally the stuff that's in the, the high jewelry section because if you want to talk about you know artisanal craft in terms of physically making things even down to the cutting of the stones and everything else that goes with it as a skill set this is combining that very traditional difficult high jewelry work with watchmaking which is equally as a difficult albeit from a much more precision based uh, engineering side but some of the stuff in this category is just unbelievably good. And usually from brands that most folk would turn their nose off at when we say watch. Yeah, like Gucci. This one's a Gucci one, but this one looks incredible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's the stuff for me that always fascinates me because it's so far away from anything. I mean, this uh, see the Van Cleef Apparel uh, there that's on there. Um, I think it's the last one. This one here, yeah. Just uh, this is the Ludo Secret Mystery, so it's unbelievably cool. Completely hidden until you pop it at the ends and it opens up to expose the watch, and it's just 
it's it's genuinely even looking at the hinge work and the kind of mechanisms for it opening up is just it's ethereal it's a whole different world yeah yeah that's really cool and and these um these sort of clocks look pretty cool at the bottom the um the car clock yeah the lp yeah. stuff is really cool you know all this kind of again it's verging into mechanical art as opposed to it's a mechanical art that happens to tell the time yeah and, and i think for me you know the mechanical clock or the jewelry sections are by far the most interesting parts of gphg it's it's where the yeah. most imagination has been used to yeah. achieve something spectacular it's, it's, you know some of these some of these uh unusual for watch nerd categories but it, it's it's where the excitement is for me at least yeah per personally I, I would have rather have seen another iwc engineer in in this category <laughs> yes. three times would have been perfect if they had just included <laughs> one more time just the clock just the wall clock or or uh, yeah just... just make a bigger version you can put on your wall that's all you need yeah just just stick it on the side of a cnc machine there we go there you <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying try to think. I mean, a lot of these brands, I'm not, I'm not overly familiar with myself. Um, you know, a lot of the. But is there any others that we should highlight in the last couple of minutes? Um, so you've got, I mean, IWC's got its perpetual calendars in there. Yeah, um, quite deservedly so. That Laurel Ferrier there, um, see just at the top of the page, you've got with the salmon dial. That there is one of the nicest watches of the last couple of years, bar none. Uh, Laurent Ferrier, yeah. very small brand, only making a couple of hundred watches a year. Um, I think there were about 125 watches a year a couple of years ago. They're up to 200, 250, something like that these days. Look, these guys get it. A, a tourbillon where they've not felt the need to cut a hole in the dial to show everybody. You know, it looks like it's just a super clean, really good looking sports watch, but it's got a tourbillon in there. So if you know, you know. If you don't, ah, eh, well, you know, who needs to know? It's a fantastic looking watch. And the bracelet on this one, um, this is a pretty Britishism, but um, it looks like a bar of dairy milk chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicholas at Fears, this is his favourite brand, isn't it? This is his, his one yeah. that he liked to get Fears to, this. Um, yeah, he, he yeah, loves it. And they are super super um kind of uh high end when it comes to kind of hot tourology um but yeah this is a stunning watch and it, it probably won't win but it probably should yeah so it's in the category with um arnold and son yeah, it's in your tourbillon category you know yeah and all of the others definitely have a more ostentatious way of viewing the tourbillon see that's uh, that laurel ferrier is the nicest looking tourbillon i've seen in a long time because I can't see it. <laughs> because, because, because it doesn't look like a tourbillon. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I mean, it's fine. Things like the HYT, that's actually acceptable to me. Not that they're all beautiful watches, but, you know, a central tourbillon like that is fine where, um, and it's it's architectural and it's, uh, you know, kind of uh, execution. The same as a lot of the Grubel 40 watches where, you know, you've got a 30 degree incline flying gyro, tur uh, gyro tourbillon. And that's fine because you need the space and it can't just hide under a dial. But in watches like this, it's okay. But again, this is a pretty cool piece with the using the oils and the kind of uh, mechanical bellows to tell the time for some facets. And you've got that very traditional uh, watch yeah. looking tourbillon in there as well. And oh, it, yes. it's, it's one of those, because a central tourbillon is very difficult to do, um, mm -hmm. pe people forget that if you poke around the Omega website, you come across the special specialities section. That's where they hide their central their central tourbillon, which doesn't yep. look like it's got a tourbillon in. But you know, it's a quarter of a million dollars. But oh my, that's an amazing watch. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, awesome. Um, and then oh, we've got another. We've got the tag glass box, and then the skipper, which arguably similar, aren't they? And they've got a Breitling in there. Yeah. And the Vitaline up the top corner there as well. Square the yeah. top. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Again, Vitaline and stun stunning uh, workmanship from uh, Carrie Vitaline as well, you know. Okay, so yeah, so that's all like Gillespie on the dial. Yeah. Incredible. It's all rose engines, yeah. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm sure we've missed a few notable, uh, 
yeah. I've, oh, it's plenty sure. of rest. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure we have. But uh, that's been really awesome. And any, is there any that we missed that we we need to that we'll get in trouble for not mentioning, or should we uh, should we wrap it up? Uh, I think we could spend a long time uh, a long time sitting here, yeah, going through some of these, you know, things like the Dimithun in there as well. You know, you've got the Hermes Luna, and there's there's some there's some amazing watches in there. The difficulty sometimes is that. There's a lot of stuff that probably doesn't appeal to your sensibilities or your aesthetic, and you just kind of if, it, if you don't like the look of something, it's very easy to just brush past it. Um, but when you start to maybe look at some of them just from what they actually are as a object, mm-hmm. you begin to see some of them. Some really quite spectacular things, you know. Like again, David Thune has got that kind of sculptural skeletal uh, framework to it. But what a lot of folk don't realise is that the lugs are actually spring-loaded, so you can see it uh, just where your cursor is uh, at uh, 3 o'clock and at 9 o'clock. You see the pivots, and you can see them in the next image. And when you put it on your wrist and you tighten the strap, they actually fold down and follow the shape of your wrist as well. You know, and again, a lot of people aren't aware that you've got those little technicalities and and things like this, which are just exquisite um, thoughts and designs. And just to prove I'm a complete peasant, on, on the back there, it's the Star Trek logo in mirror form. It's the Starfleet <laughs> yeah. logo as a mirror, <laughs> just to show I'm a peasant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then, uh, Thomas is saying the Vutalinen and the Beauvais for Beauvais yeah. from the men's competition. Okay, so there's a Beauvais. Beauvais. Um, yeah. Wow, it's got a sort of concave. Oh, that's cool. There's, that the, uh, there's some face. stunning pieces. Yeah. Uh, constant moon. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Cool. Well, perhaps we'll leave it there. But uh, yeah, if we missed if we missed your favourite watch, we apologise. Um, big thanks to everyone in the comment section and big thanks to the, the panel for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time on Casual Watch Talk. Thanks, everyone.